Hey guys, good evening. Welcome to Tall Tales with Taco Bell. I'm your host, Mitch Bell. I'm a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, and I got to tell you, Marine history is one of my favorite subjects. Tonight is going to be a very special night. We've got Dave Holland, a Marine who lives in Australia, but also lives part-time over in Guadalcanal. So I could think of no better expert than Dave, to talk to us about the Battle of Guadalcanal and what the guys entailed, how it looked for him. And we've got some great on the ground photographs of his explorations into the actual areas where John Bassalone, famous Medal of Honor recipient, received his medal and uh, just all the stuff that was going on. Without further delay, here we go. Dave, how are you from down yeah. under? I'm good, Taco. Thanks again for um, having me on, and it's a it's a pleasure and an honor. Are you kidding, man? This is an this is an honor for me. You and I started talking months ago about doing a podcast and uh, going over this stuff because you know, as as you said, your your site, which I'm going to throw up here on um, YouTube. Walking the battlefield, walking a battlefield, walking the battlefield is history. It's not for entertainment. It is straight up history. And what I love the most about it is the raw detail. And then you incorporate the maps and different things to be able to take the viewer into the actual battlefield. I can hear the insects buzzing around. The only thing that's missing are bullets whizzing by and uh, the heat, the oppressive heat, right? Well, I could have got one of my buddies to, to fire a few rounds out to make a little more authentic, but yes, it's it's <laughs> one of my viewers said it's a uh, history with no frills. So yes, I'm I made it that way, and I made it to um, basically uh, it's like a tour, like I'm taking you on a, on a tour of it. So it's not yeah. for entertainment. Well, some guys might get some entertainment out of it, but it's uh, pure educational. Oh, it's a great point of view, uh, personal you know point of view as you're walking through the jungle and and being able to look and go, okay. You know, that's northeast. The Japanese were over there. The machine guns would have been set up here. Um, so let's let's step back for a second. How did you end up down in Australia, mate? Uh, how does how does a Marine, um, a young single Marine end up in Australia, do you think? I'll give you well, probably... uh, embassy duty, MSG. Or were you? Yes. Uh... Yes. Yes. I was I was there. I was on um, Marine Embassy Guard in, in Canberra in the early 90s. Uh -huh. So I left Australia, obviously I was in the Marines, but what brought me back to Australia, you think? What brings me back? A couple of reasons, but the main reason is as a woman. So yes, I've, I've married an Australian and I moved back. And plus I love the country too. It's a, it's a great place. So that's yeah, how I ended up being. I've been here 20, 27, almost 28 years now. Yeah. You know, every now and then I'll hear a little infliction in your, in your accent, your voice, you're picking up the Aussie, right? Yeah. You know, I had a guy tell me, asked me one time on the comments, he says, I can't pick your accent. He said, it's like a mixture between uh, Adelaide and, and Alabama. And I said, well, <laughs> you, you picked it. That's a, that was a good, good choice, good pick there. But it throws yeah, a lot. It, of it does. It comes out a little Southern, comes out every now and then with a little Aussie. It's kind of funny. It's a good mix. <laughs> so now tell me about your job that allows you to go over and work with uh, the folks over there at Guadalcanal. Yeah, so I work for the Australian government and um I got a chance to go over ever since 2009. Um, in 2009, I first went over for four months and I did some initial on the ground work there as much as I could in four months. Um, and then um, 2010, probably to 2012, I made a, a number of smaller trips. Mm -hmm. But then in 2018, I got the opportunity to live there for two years, be posted there permanently for two years. And um, I went there in 2020. So I'm trying to get back with work. If I don't get back with work, um, I plan to go back over uh, next year. Mm -hmm. um, at this stage, Solomon Islands is, um, I guess, for tourism, 
or for any outside visitors, it's closed off due to COVID. So still, yeah, still they're talking about July. I mean, COVID didn't hit there until later. I think late last year, the first COVID case they had. So they've shut the borders down. They're talking about opening up in July. I'm, I'm waiting to see because this is the 80th anniversary this year. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, how are the locals uh, in terms of the local, you know, the history, the marine history? Is it kind of like they just are so used to it? They're plowing the ground, find a couple of hand grenades, give you a call. Hey, come disarm this stuff. Or how do they handle the history? Well, the Solomon Islands uh, people are generally a, a younger population, so they don't really remember too much about World War II. I mean, most of their, I guess, uh, ancestors are, are, are since past. I mean, there's some monuments, but the majority of, of people there that walk around, a lot of them are squatters from a larger island called Malaita. So they come to Guadalcanal, so they just walk around. They don't know what's happened there. Um, they know there's some unexplored ordnance. I mean, especially in the last couple of years, unfortunately, there's been a number of um, Australians and um, some expats who have been killed and seriously injured from unexplored ordnance. Uh, what are they doing, trying to pick up a hand grenade and bring it back? Well, um, something like that, um, uh, or trying to, uh, I wouldn't say disarm, try to cut shells open to make uh, bombs for fishing with, where unfortunately sometimes just creating a fire to, to cook food. And um, I think, was it last year? Yeah, last year there was an unfortunate, a couple of locals died. Um, they were set a fire up just to cook some normal food. And unfortunately, there was a 105 millimeter house run exploded underneath them. So it, it high ordered. And, and oh, you're killed. kidding. Oh, my God. Yeah. Just in just the ground. Young, young, just young Solomon Island locals minding their own business, just having a bit of a uh, a cookout fire. Bang. Dead. Well, it's a major issue. And, you know, that's their major, major problem. And as the population expands in Haniar, which is the capital city, um, they're encroaching on areas where in for years those ordinance has been uh, undisturbed and but obviously they're disturbing them by, by building on them and, and, and clearing the land. Yeah. I noticed in some of your videos, the uh, Mitchell page, that whole area is urbanized now. I mean, houses and streets and. Yeah. They're in, in Hardy ours built on the coast. And, you know, when they expand, they expand up the hills. I mean, yes, they were fighting in the hills, but Guadalcanal um, post February 43 became a major logistical and training base. So some of those hill positions, ridges, were um, firing ranges used for training firing ranges in 44 and 45. I mean, I have all the range maps and it has all the, um, you know, high artillery tank and uh, naval, naval gunfire or ranges in there. So there's a lot of unexploded ordnance. Well, let's go back. Well, uh, I've got some maps of the area and this is the strategic situation for the southwest Um as you're looking at that, what most folks don't realize how close Guadalcanal truly is to Australia and right north there, New Guinea and all, all those areas were all captured by the Japanese, weren't they? Oh, uh, yes. And you probably can't sit that, that clear for you viewers, but there's some red circles there. and the red circles was the areas the Japanese had captured. You so you, for your viewers, you'll see uh, Australia, then straight north, you'll see New Guinea. And that was Papua, Papua New Guinea. And to the right of that is the Solomon Islands. And to, to the far right of the, that, probably the, one of the last island chains, or islands in the island chain is Guadalcanal, which is about 90 miles long and about 25 miles wide. So you see the, the blue arrows or the blue lines. That was the lines of communications that the Americans had, the two main right. routes, to Australia and New Zealand. So when the Japanese had pushed through in, in May of, of 42, um, their main objective was Port Moresby, which is in the southern part of New Guinea there. It's Papua. Pop, it's like the little, little bit that, that comes down to the end on the far right. And there you can see how close it is to Australia. Yeah. They're in the end of Australia. So their objective, main objective was to take Port Moresby, and they were going to do it head on with amphibious invasion in May of 42. So you're probably familiar with the Battle of um, the Coral Sea, you know, the first carrier battle in history. Right. May 42, the Americans had, you know, broken the Japanese naval code and they knew that the Japanese were coming that way with a, a large task force. So they, um, the Australians and the, um, the Americans had a naval task force and they defeated the Japanese or probably a draw 
but there was a strategic defeat. So they uh, stopped the, the, full, the, I guess, the head-on amphibious invasion of Port Moresby. So that allowed the Japanese, um, they decided to do part two. So they hit the, the land base. They came in Buna and Gona, which is on the northern coast of New Guinea. They come over the Kokoda Trail or the Kokoda wow. Track. And that's how that campaign started. And they were going to take it from the land landway. So at the same time that the in May of 42, when they were taking that, uh, one small group went to a place called Tulagi. Now, Tulagi is about 20 miles north of Guadalcanal, and that was the seat of the British uh, ruling colonial government because that was a British protectorate, the Solomon Islands at the time. So they're, they're, uh, they're, yeah, there's Tulagi. So they had a, a British colonial outpost there, and it's what you think a British colonial outpost would be. You know, it had a, a tennis court and golf golf big you know, thing nine hole golf course country club and they were living a good colonial style life there right and it, it gavutu which is a small island off off tulagi um they um and after uh i think it's december january 41 or even before that the australians had a, a naval plane base there and they had a float plane base and they had a few australian air force and a, some australian commandos there with a few um float planes at, at Gavutu. So when in the invasion of Port Moresby, there was a small contingent of um, Japanese Special Naval Landed Force guys, a third Kuri uh, Special Naval Landed Force. They landed at Tulagi, you know, and it was unopposed. Right, landing. right there up there by Florida Island, just south yeah, of Florida Tulagi. Island. Yeah, right. Tulagi. So they, they landed in Tulagi in May. So that was the furthest, I guess, reach in the Southwest Pacific the Japanese did in the war at Tulagi. So what they were going to, they're, they had a couple of objectives we were taking to Lagi. Uh, the first one was to want to render that um, float plane base inoperative. Mm-hmm. And also, um, I guess you said three reasons. Uh, also to provide uh, a covering because they were going to put their own float planes in there, put a covering for the, the Japanese invasion of Port Moresby. So they were going to cover the Japanese left flank for an American incursion. It might've came from that direction. And also too, it was going to be the uh, springboard for further advance in the Southwest Pacific um, because they did have uh, plans to advance further in the Southwest Pacific to cut off that, um, that very important supply line to Australia. So they were going to go on to Fiji, uh, New Hebrides or New Caledonia, as we know it nowadays and and on to Samoa. So that was a major, major threat the Japanese um, had. And it was a major um, um, issue and problem that the the allies were looking into. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I guess some of your viewers would have heard, uh, or listeners would have heard of the Coast Watchers. Yeah. And the Coast Watchers was a, as a network set up by the Australians, um, at the end of world one actually. And it was designed to do uh, a network of small outposts in Northern Australia and in the islands to serve as, you know, listening posts. And then when war two became, um, began or right before that, the Australians set up, uh, a number of outposts and they incorporated some island islanders like plantation owners and government officials as such and then they, they dropped radios off to them and they taught them how to use them this was right before the war because they yeah. they're foreseeing that the japanese could come that way and it would be a great uh, intelligence network so once the japanese the war started the japanese did come to the southwest pacific um, some of these guys stayed back um, guadalcanal had three coast watchers and probably the most famous was Martin Clemens, who was a, uh, he wasn't Australian, he was British, he was Scottish actually. And he was a, uh, a low ranked uh, colonial official that was stationed at, at Tulagi in Guadalcanal before the war. So he stayed back and got another guy called Snowy Rhodes, which was an, an ex Australian digger, which is a, a name for a soldier, World War I soldier. I think he was in a light horse, pretty, pretty tough character. I read stories yeah. about him. I think they had another guy, McFarlane. I have to double check that one, but they def- definitely had three on Guadalcanal. You, you so, know, you know, the first time I ever heard about the Coast Watchers when Bob Black Sheep was it? Bob Black Sheep, Peter Frampton, man. <laughs> Peter yeah, Frampton he, was a Coast he, Watcher. Who knew? Me and my friend, um, we used to watch that when we was little growing up, and we, we still talk about that. And that was the first time I ever heard "God Save the Queen." I thought, hold on, man, this song's "God." No, "God Save the King." Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. I said. I've heard that before. That's an American song. Yeah, it's obviously it's a, a bridge. <laughs> yeah. well, that's the first time. And yeah, and, um, that was quite funny. But yeah, Clemens was, uh, 
the guy that he stayed back, he stayed back with the Solomon Island um, um, Islanders. A lot of them were former uh, British protector police, Solomon Island police. Right. Famous was Jacob Vuza. But he stayed back. And anyway, we started looking and he's getting reports that the Japanese were building an airfield because the Japanese were at Tulagi and, and, you know, and they noticed about 20 miles away, the, you know, obviously Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal had uh, massive uh, coconut plantations pre-war by the Lieber brothers. They owned all these coconut plantations. And they had these cattle and they had the cattle with, with you know, just like they do when you nowadays, you know, if you want to, uh, reduce vegetation. You put the cattle there and eat all of the lower vegetation, you know, natural um, lawnmowers like a like a billy goat, so to speak. Um, but the Japanese noticed the the cattle over there, so they're going to get some fresh beef cattle. So they went over there, and some of the engineers started looking around at the Lunga Plains. They said, "We could build a major uh, airstrip here, and we could build a number of airstrips if we needed to." Yeah, there you is, go. Is now this is plan. dated forty three. So is this American strips or Japanese? That's actually 45 and that's American strips. Um, okay. That was what the, the whole network because uh, America at, in, by 1945 had six major airfields running on Guadalcanal, but you'll see to the right there, that's Lunga point. Oh, that there. And then, okay. That's a good one. Keep it on that, that one there. Yep. So, so what we're showing here is uh, that's late August, early September, Henderson field. That's one of my favorite photos. And this shows what it looked like. Um, I think it's dated August the 27th. So, you know, the, the Cactus Air Force, which is the Air Force on Guadalcanal, the Marines first landed there on um, August the, the 20th when they first landed their, their planes with two squadrons, had a squadrons of um, Hellcats or Wildcats, Wildcats. SPDs, about 30 planes landed. But this is what they landed on. But this you'll see to the right, those huts, that's the actual Japanese um, hangars that they'd built. Uh -huh. The Japanese yeah. built, and you see the little building on the left. That's the pagoda. So that was the famous pagoda. That was the, the air control center the Marines had, and that was a Japanese um, officers' club. They called it pagoda. But you'll notice on that airstrip there, it had been bombed quite a number of times. You saw a lot of, a lot of those photo, a lot of those holes there are bomb right. craters, right. and also um, AA gun pits, any aircraft gun pits. But the, they knew they were building this this airstrip, so. Uh, they started building it in, in July. Well, yeah, June and July of, of 42. The Japanese did. The Japanese did. They started building this airstrip. So the Allied High Command um, sent some B-17s up to verify what the Coast Watchers were saying. And they knew that, look, you know, we can't allow them to build an airstrip on Guadalcanal. If they built this airstrip on Guadalcanal, they would allow them to interdict the uh, supply lines to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. And then, you know, we know it now. But at the time, they thought the Japanese were going to come to invade Australia. But what the Japanese had intended to do, they had no plans, real plans. I mean, they did have some plans in, in place, but no definite plans. The Navy was had thoughts, but the Army said no way of invading Australia. Mm -hmm. But what they were going to do is their their plan was to cut Australia off because, you know, Australia had been cut off from, from England um, from that direction. So if they cut them off from America... Then I would isolate Australia, and you know, at the time, Australia uh, were getting all the resources, mainly in, in a lot of their supplies from America, well, all their supplies basically. And they thought if they could cut Australia off, then Australia could sue for a separate peace and maybe come to terms. That was, you know, that was their yeah, not likely. Yeah, so you know, they wanted the Australians to to come to some terms, but you know, they couldn't allow them to to cut off Australia and New Zealand. So back, back to this map, you see Henderson Field. That was the only airfield at the time, correct? Yeah, there was the only airfield at the time. So the unsinkable aircraft carrier, it's been called. Um, in September, they started, they built an auxiliary field called Fighter 2. And that's where they ran their fighter planes out of. And then in November and December, they started building Fighter Strip 2. And you go back to that other photo where it shows the three airstrips and it shows those three. And they were... They're up and running in, in, in 1943. So you'll see them one, two, three. The one in the middle is Henderson, uh -huh. and they actually call that the bomber bomber field. And then the one in the top right, or the very top of the photo, that's called um, Fighter Field 2 or Cookham Airfield. Right on the water. About, yeah, Cookham. That was a Cookham area. That was where they, when the Japanese landed. They had all their docks and, and a lot of their um, buildings and things at Cookham there. But, um, 
uh, an event associated with that one is the Yamamoto uh, shoot down by the P-38s. They flew from that field. Sometimes you hear them, it said they flew from Henderson Field. They didn't fly from Henderson Field. They flew from that one at the top there. That's called okay. Fighter, Fighter 2. Yeah, they yeah, flew out of there. Yeah, the 38s out of there, huh? Yeah. But the one at the bottom, um, this is, I think this photo is from really 44, 45. So it's well established. You can notice how the, you know, there was great infrastructure there. But Fighter Field 1 was called the Cow Pasture. And that was the one at the bottom. It didn't look like that in, in September when Joe Falls and the rest of them were fi flying out of there. But all the, a lot of the, um, the famous Marine aces flew out of that one at the bottom fighter fighter field one. Which is amazing in that photograph, look in the top, right. You see all the little dots in the ocean ships yeah. sitting yeah, on the coast one, there. Major, major um, supply base. Well, do you know what, the what was the local population back in that, in that time frame? Do you know? Were there, uh, I don't know, but there was no, there's no established towns. There were small villages in the, in the Melanesian culture. They all lived on the coast. Um, yeah. I know in the area, where the main fighting took place, and it was only what thirty miles, not even that. I'd say twenty miles of coastline, mm -hmm. and there were probably about six villages. And like I stated before, it was um, coconut plantations. Right. So you only had, I think, four villages in there, and each village probably had maybe twenty to thirty, maybe forty people at the most. So yeah. So not if a guy got shot down, you wanted him, you wanted to get picked up by the coast watchers and not brought back to the wrong island, right? Oh, yeah. And then yeah, the, the locals did a lot of that, um, the rescuing of the, the down pilots. I mean, that was the one benefit that the, the Allied or the American pilots had over the Japanese pilots. You know, when the Japanese pilots got shot down, if you know, even if they were, they landed alive, you know, once you know, either they killed themselves or the locals would have killed them. Wow. This this map, looking at this Allig Alligator Creek. Talk talk about. This now, first of all, looking straight down at Alligator Creek, in relation, where is Henderson Field to the right or to the left? To the left. I mean, this is a my friend Peter Flavin, who's of Guadalcanal then and now. He does some great uh, Guadalcanal then and now photos. He sent me that one. We go back to that one. Yeah, I'm, I was looking for the over. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, answer your question. If you look where it says Alligator Creek there, the, the runway's been extended, so that's the end of the runway. Runway uh, nowadays goes all the way to the end of Alligator Creek, so it's off to the left or off to the, the um, west there. But in 1942, the runway was probably, you know, about seven, 800 yards away. <clears throat> and um, pre-war, when the, the service of these coconut plantation had the go uh, government tracker, the coastal track, and where the coastal track was, they didn't have a bridge over Alligator Creek, or at the time, um, the Marines called it Alligator Creek, but its official name is Elu River. And, the, and on some maps, they call the Battle of the Teneru, or on the initial Marine maps, I have Marine maps, and they call it the, the Teneru River. It was mislabeled. The Teneru is off to the right, you know, a mile or two down. So this is Elu River. It's just a, um, it's not a free-flowing river. It's more like a, a coastal tidal river that fills uh -huh. up and tides up. But anyway, they, the only way across it was that sandbar. And at low tide, you could drive cars and, and uh, walk across it. So that was the main crossing point. All so, the way up to the where it says wire 1942 up there by the mouth? Yeah, and you see the sandbar. The sandbar, This I yeah. think Peter might have took this photo. It's a 2011, but you know, even if you go on Google Maps today, you can still see the sandbar and it's still there. And if you go into my videos, I mean, I, I really I walk you through it. And you can see the yeah. sandbar quite quite clearly i think you got a few photos of the sandbar today but yeah that was the yeah so that's i know the the listeners can't see this but basically this is a a nowadays uh, photo and it's looking to the west and you're looking at it from a, a japanese point of view mm -hmm. so green positions was in that uh, tree line there that jungle line right and and the sandbars probably from this position probably 70 to 80 meters away and this is the the route that japanese took on they made three assaults and two of their assaults went straight down the beach straight across that sandbar straight into right the marine open positions. i mean holy crap that is that is well, so open right there i mean yeah and and at the time of the battle there was coconut trees all through there but the the beach was was just like it is there and to the left was coconut plantations i mean you can see some contemporary photos at the time and it's all coconut plantations and nice, neat rows. 
but they they did two assaults at night across it um, to try to push across. And then the third assault, they, they tried to go across downstream down the river, but you know, with an engineering uh, group, but they, they only got into the river and they said it's too deep. So the third attempt, they went out into the surf uh -huh. and tried to come back in where it says beach volleyball court there. They tried to yeah. uh, flank the Marines, so to speak. But once again, the, the Marines, it's the second battalion, first Marines had a L shape there. So they went, their defensive line ran down Alligator Creek and also ran uh -huh. down the, uh, the beach because at the time, <clears throat> Vandegrift, the, the division commander, um, especially being Marines, they thought that the main Japanese counterattack would hit them at Lunga Point um, in the form of an amphibious assault. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have enough Marines at that stage to form a 360-degree perimeter, so it's more of a horseshoe-shaped perimeter, about eight miles there, about eight miles, if that, that he had. And he had the first Marines on the man in the beach, and on the right-hand side, and he had the fifth Marines man in the, the beach on the left-hand side, and 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 um, a flank to the left. So where you see Lucky, that's Lucky from the Pacific that we yeah, see like, on the TV show. Yeah, we've worked out where his machine gun was in the, in the Pacific series. So his machine gun was further downstream. So he, um, great infiltrating fire. So if you go to my video, um, Val Alligator Creek, you know, I can, mm -hmm. I'll walk you through it and I can show you the infiltrating fire and the grazing fire the Marines had, and it's a great position. Mm -hmm. Then you had Schmidt there, which is his machine gun. So Schmidt was uh, – there was a movie made during the war called Pride of the Marines, I think it was called, uh -huh. based on the, the three uh, gun crew that the Marines had there, and they're, they're, uh, all three earned Navy crosses. So you probably heard this story. I heard this story at boot camp. You know, you had Schmidt, Rivers, and Diamond. Do you remember the story that – Oh, the, Luke Diamond one with the Marine. Mustang. One Marine was blind, and the other Marine had his hands um, damaged. So the blind one fired the gun, and the, the one with his hands damaged uh, guided him. Yeah. So this is this is the the story. So their machine gun was instrumental in, in taking out a lot of the Japanese, and obviously they drew a lot of attention of the Japanese because they want to take that machine gun out. So Johnny Rivers uh, was a machine gunner. He was firing a machine gun initially, and um, Rivers uh, got shot, and um, there were grenades exploding left and right, <clears throat> and he got shot and killed. And he remained on the gun for a few rounds, and then they, they pushed his body aside, and Smith jumped on the gun. And Diamond was the team leader, Corporal, and he was running the, uh, as the loader. So they're firing away, firing away. And I think a, a grenade or uh, a mortar round hit in front of them and uh -huh. blinded Smith and, and severely wounded uh, Diamond in the arms. So, so this, we're talking about Lou Diamond, right? The, with the, no, not Lou Diamond. No, not Lou Diamond, another Diamond. No, not that famous fellow, <laughs> the, the border man. But yeah, but they, they became a, they earned all three Navy crosses and they earned um, there was a movie made of them, the big propaganda, know, propaganda, but big um, bonds went on the bonds tour and everything with Al Smith. He was blind for the rest of his life, but yeah, it's a famous. Scene. Well, looking down on this where Lucky's machine gun is in the TV show, it looked, it didn't look as, as wide. How wide is that Creek in actuality? So I don't know. It's, I, I know exactly how it was at the time. I mean, I've got photos. I mean, I could probably do a, a scale model or you know, scaling everything, but haven't changed that much. So I'd say at that stage, we're down, down the creek where it says Lucky, which is probably about four or 500 yards down. Right. So it's probably about maybe 70, 70, 80 yards. Maybe 70 uh, yards across. And were there actually saltwater crocodiles in there? Was that the deal? Yeah. Well, I don't know so much at the time. Um, there's still to this day the saltwater crocs, but I don't, I know the Marines seen, seen them in there. I, I don't know. I think a lot of this has blew up out of proportion over years because you got to remember they landed on the, the 7th of August. Thousands of Marines crossed that sandbar with vehicle traffic and everything else. This was August the 21st. So they'd been in there for at least, you know, two to three weeks, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Marines walk, walking through there because by living on Guadalcanal, I know that saltwater crocs won't hang around areas where thousands of people are, you know, yeah. especially with guns. You know, they'll go to somewhere else. <clears throat> so, and, and what they do, they, they hang around the, the, the creek mouse and the river mouse because, you know, anything dead floats out there. But there's right. definitely some water crops, and it would have, should have probably might have been one or two there at the end of time. But then, you know, chewing on the Japanese bodies, I don't know. I think some of that was some of the tales Grandpa told just to sound pretty good. <laughs> Who knows? Here's a great shot that you have. 
showing showing where Diamond was and the machine gun, the 37 millimeter, and the Japanese coming across? Yeah, so this is another um, – myself and, and Peter Flavin will work together, and he does all the – illustrations for me but they peter did this one too so you'll see the no, woman did a great job these are awesome well the top bit there is was taken probably the day before the day after we're trying to still work that out by a plane flying over and if you, if you zoom down in it we've looked at these photos very up close and there's there's some rings at the sandbar and we think they're putting out barbed wire so there might have been a day before just a little a side note on that what was quite unique because as you know the um the Navy pulled out very quickly in August the 9th at the Dallas Island and a lot of the supplies went uh, with the Navy. Um, there were only, a, I think, 18 spools of barbed wire was offloaded for the whole division. Oh. So there was a, I didn't have much barbed wire to, to dig in on. So one of the enterprising privates was walking around and all this, these pre-war coconut plantations had some barbed wire on it, you know, to keep the cattle, I guess, out of certain areas. So uh -huh. he went to a lieutenant there and said, hey, sir, can we use some of this barbed wire? The, you know, we don't have any barbed wire. Can we use some of this, you know, cheap civilian style barbed wire off these trees? He goes, yeah, why not? Anyway, they put one strand of barbed wire um, on the sandbar. And that became the Marine's secret, secret weapon because when the Japanese were moving through, um, the first group hit this barbed wire and it was probably imagine about knee high. And, uh -huh. he, and, you know, you've probably been on pack marches before, the old accordion effect. As soon as right. the first hit, hit it, the rest of them just go boom, 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 you know, just – they all stopped and they, you know, what's happening? Like, doo -doo -doo. You could, um, that's why the first Japanese and, uh, you know, the, the quote, what the veterans actually said, this, we could hear him gibbering and jabbering and, and yelling and, and, and carrying on. Right. And then when we initiated 37 millimeter anti-tank gun in the, in the 50 and 30 cows, you know, we initiated the ambush with that. So that, that one strand of barbed wire was the secret weapon. So I don't wow. know. Wow. I wish I could find that that private's name. You know, it might be lost to history, but a good initiative. <laughs> yeah, Which, yeah. Well, you know, also to kind of describe the topography because right there on the ocean, pretty flat. You got some palm trees and coconut trees and stuff like that. But the you go up and you have these beautiful high ridge lines on some of the uh, little uh, hills, and then you go down and you in thick of the jungle, right? Yeah, Guadalcanal is like a lot of volcano islands, um, volcanic islands, um, very um, high, steep mountains. I think the, the highest mountain on Guadalcanal is 8,000 feet high. Wow. So, and you got the coastal plains where, where the Lunga Plains is, where the airfields are built. So they were anything flat in that air, especially around the rivers, were, were coconut plantations. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the ridges, and you'll see in, in a lot of my videos, especially the, the thin red line one or the, the galloping horse. Uh, you'll see those ridges there, the coral ridges, and they're yeah. barren. The, the coral ridges are barren, and I, it was explained to me because there's not much topsoil there, and the, the big trees can't grow on there. You know, that's a good example. That's actually that's actually on the, the galloping horse um, where you're showing in, showing here. So you got this the kunai grass, which is that tall grass, yeah. And that's really the only thing. It's the small plants. So the hills are barren, and the, and the hills the the, the the ridges are barren. Then you get into the thick jungles and the ravines, real thick jungles. And um, yeah, so that's that's some of the Barcelona area there. So that's thick jungle that we've cleared. But just to show, yeah, just show just some of the jungle. But here it is back then. That was a great shot you had with a kid stringing the barbed wire and finding that spot. Yeah, we located that area. Yeah, that was near the Barcelona area down there too. Real thick area. They had to clear out. Well, let me ask you this. Australia, you got so much stuff that'll kill you, right? Like eight different kinds of venomous spiders that one bite will, uh, you'll, you'll die in your sleep. You've got snakes galore. What do they have over there? Or is it like uh, New Zealand? They don't have anything poisonous. Well, they got a lot of things poisonous. Um, <clears throat> obviously, disease, tropical disease is probably the worst thing. And, you know, obviously the dengue fever. And the malaria um, is born by the mosquitoes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then there's not many snakes over there. And what snakes they have um, aren't poisonous. There's one poisonous snake in one of the out, outlying islands I've been called, but not on Guadalcanal. Um, they have a like, little small boas, but they don't mm -hmm. see many snakes there. Um, you got some scorpions, but they're not poisonous scorpions, but you don't want them to bite you. Um, and obviously, you got the 
the the saltwater crocs is probably not the best thing and you have the all the sharks in the areas but the biggest well, thing about all the guys yeah i'm sorry go ahead no, the biggest thing is gonna get you in guadalcanal just like it uh, today just like it was then is the um, diseases mm. by the mosquitoes, mosquitoes. The creepy crawlies there's a lot of those. i was just i was just thinking you know as you're sitting in a hole somewhere you know some spider what are your videos you go oh sorry and you didn't even flinch but you're like oh Sorry, a big spider just landed on my head. Yeah, they're not poisonous, thank goodness. I mean, you know, just like walking anywhere, in a, especially in the woods back in in, a, in America, you know, it, you, walking through it, not spider webs hitting you in the face. You know, oh, what's this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's show Barcelona. So this shot here, Edson's Ridge, was that uh, like the photograph I, I have right here? Is that? No, what I'm, what that photograph, go back to that photograph. I threw that photograph in. What you're looking at there is where Medal of Honor was earned. Um, Charles Davis was in the U.S. Army in the 25th Division, uh, 27th Regiment, and um, I think it's January the 14th, 1943, and the assault of Gallipin Horse Ridge was near Mount Austin. The U.S. Army had to assault this ridge. Now, it's depicted quite loosely in the thin red line, in yeah, the book, the in the movies, because James Jones, the guy who wrote the Thin Red Line, the book was in the second in this battalion, second battalion, the twenty seventh regiment, the Wolfhounds, I call them, of the twenty fifth infantry division, and his the movie is basically is is pretty much it's a fictional account, but it's based on his battalion's actions, and John Cusack in in the modern movie, there was another movie made in the sixties apparently, but the modern movie that everyone's aware of, his part he loosely plays captain charles davis who actually lived lived through the war and he earned a medal of honor there so what you were looking at there was the spot where davis and four others crawled up at the reverse slope um in the japanese bunker complex so the, the japanese bunkers are right before you there um the holes are still there obviously the bunker is not there because they made a, a coconut and uh, logs and and sandbags and, and dirt at the time but davis and his other four threw a number of hand grenades and um, just oh, don't rolling them down the hill, weren't they? Well, they threw them, they threw them out and then they charged. And what they were supposed to do, Davis and his other guys are supposed to be a diversionary and they're supposed to throw some hand grenades, get the Japanese attention on that reverse slope. And the battalion commander in, in E company was on the, on the Eastern side and they were going to charge over the top and hit these guys in the rear. Uh -huh. well, what happened was when Davis and the rest of the guys threw their hand grenades, they just jumped up and they charged and Davis let them. They took out the bunker himself. Davis had his M1 Garand. He fired a few rounds and had a stoppage. Then he transitioned to his 45 and he continued on the assault. And because, because and he, he was supposed to do it and blow a whistle. And if you notice in the movie, The Thin Red Line, he's blowing a whistle. So that was based on uh, actual truth, too. But the division commander, um, 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 Collins, well, Lightning Joe Collins, who became a pretty famous and is a seventh corps commander in Europe, he, um, he was watching it from a nearby hill about 250 yards away. And and when Davis was on that skyline, the whole division could basically see him. Earned right. Medal of Honor. So they, that was that was in the Medal of Honor area. And that's that area in the Galloping Horse. You'll if you go to my videos and it's called Charles Davis in the Thin Red Line. That's the least visited battlefield on Guadalcanal because it's hard to to get there. Yeah. And it's probably the best preserved. And if you want to see how the terrain looked like at the time, you go to that video itself and it's it's great. And and please, if you're listening to this right now, you can go to YouTube, Guadalcanal, walking a battlefield. And if you just Google that, put it in the search bar, you'll be able to uh, pull Dave's videos up. And they're fascinating. He has all aspects, all different things from five minutes long to 20 minutes long, uh, showing aspects of the uh, different battles. And I know right now we're trying to encompass just an overall deal in such a short amount of time but uh this really as a history guy is fascinating to me this is a photo of Barcelona's position and how were you all able to determine because didn't Barcelona go back there or and show them where well i guess they all came back and saw where the action was and yeah okay this <laughs> There was a the late um, historian is an Australian expat, John Innes. He lived on the island. And I met John a number of times, and he you know, went on a 
me and him spent a week together basically in 90 in 2009 he took me to a lot of these positions and he took me to the Barcelona position this position here and he and I asked him I said what do you think it's the Barcelona position he says look I'm not entirely sure he said but it's in this area yeah and um, he said I didn't spend as much time as I really wanted in, in trying to find this location he says um I said geez we'd, I'd love to find it he goes well that is your mission to find it now the one in my video and the ones in this photo here uh, I can't say 100 percent that's Barcelona's position and and now that I, I've been doing a lot more research, I've spent two years researching it and walking the ground. Not too many people going in that area. It's a very thick swamp. And I feel for the poor guys that was in there at the time. So I spent a lot of research on it, um, doing a lot of map work, on the ground walking. Um, I think his positions, he had two positions, two bunkers. I think his bunkers are a few, probably about 200 to 250 yards further uh, toward coffin corners that's further to the east yeah right. so, I think, so this is another one of the maps you know showing here that are using for references is that uh on the far left arrow in that open area is that a river or what is that the far left arrow so the arrows are where the japanese attacked but that line is a road uh, yeah coffin, uh, coffin corner there it looks like an open area yeah that's a Big Kunai grass area, and it's, I have some great photos uh, made at the time. They had bunkers in the, the tree line there. The Marines had the bunkers, and the Army layer had the bunkers in there. It was covered um, by crisscross barbed wire and registered artillery fire, and it was about 200 yards across. It was about 2,500 yards long. They call it the bowling yeah. alley. And um, on the night of – so the Japanese – the, their largest assault, they made three major assaults on Guadalcanal. Because you got to remember, the Japanese were on, wasn't on the defensive in Guadalcanal. They were on the offensive. In fact, yeah. Guadalcanal was probably the last real offensive, not counting China, Burma, India theater, that the Japanese had. And the Battle of Coffin Corner here, um, Barcelon area, you got the Barcelon area. He was in the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. So they got hit hard the first night. So the, yeah. we don't have much time here, but – um, to go into the, the Battle of Henderson Field and the Japanese plan. But the Japanese had the second Sendai Division, the main elements of it. So roughly about 7,000 guys were going to hit this area, you know, in a coordinated attack. But unfortunately, it's like all, all three of their major assaults, the Japanese uh, didn't coordinate their – they couldn't coordinate their attacks. You know, the terrain was their enemy, so to speak. You know, the terrain was against them. Right. They had a plan. And once they had a plan in place, you know, the, they are very centralized, um, they stuck to their plan. Um, but that coffin corner area was the scene of the largest Japanese assault. Not too many people know about it. And the U S army 164th regiment, which oh, they call themselves 164th Marines, which is a great unit. They were the first U S army units to be sent in to uh, reinforce the Marines. They landed in October the 13th, 42, um, national guard unit of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin, um, and, and Chesty Puller called them the farm boys. He said, oh, all these farm boys can fight. But they were a very good unit. Um, but they were involved, especially in the second night, uh, the major assaults at Coffin Corner. And they, you know, they 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 killed hundreds and hundreds of Japanese. And and that assault at Coffin Corner, and I'd go as far to say I can't find any more. And if you don't count China, Burma, India, that was the last Japanese offensive assault of the war, I think, against the in the, in the Pacific. I mean, yeah, you had bonsai attacks, but they're not a bonsai attack, as you know, is is not a planned offensive operation. Normally, it's like you know the last ditch effort. Okay, we you know, die horribly. Why the Japanese would say, let's do a mass assault, but right. these were coordinated, supposed to be coordinated um, assault because the Marines. Yes, it was Guadalcanal was the first um, offensive by the Americans in World War Two, but then it quickly became a defensive struggle. So it was offensive in. in in fact, to take the airfield, then they, they dug in. And then so they, that line, that line from Coffin Corner to Barcelona up to Bloody Ridge, that's like 2,500 yards? Yeah, it's about 2,500, 2,600 yards. And that and was it, manned by what, 500? Yeah, 500 what happened? Marines was, against how many Japanese? Well, probably about 6,000 initially. That was what was planned. But, you know, because the Japanese couldn't coordinate it and because the, the, the jungle was very limited, they, um, the Japanese tactics, you know, they went in 
avenues of approach. <clears throat> there was two main main avenue approach to that thick jungle. One was the the trail that Barcelon was covering. They right. had a tra track there, a trail there. It was called the Sector Three Trail. That had, well, that ain't a trail. That that photo there is. You can see how thick jungle is on both sides. You know, Barcelon said he could see 25 yards on the other side. You could see about 20 yards to the wire, and about 25 yards on the other side. So they own about 75 yards of a field of fire. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. What the Marines did, you notice, there's about four foot tall barbed wire, and they just put stacks of barbed wire up, obviously as an obstacle, hoping that the Japanese would hit them and then hang up on it, and then they could cut them down with their uh, machine gun fire. Because those bunker lines, the Marines had coconut log in, um, encased bunkers, and they held a machine gun in every bunker because what they would do is they would go back to the um, airfield graveyard, so to speak, the boneyard, they called it, because um, it wasn't too far from Fighter One and Henderson, and they'd pull machine guns off the, the, the crash planes. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you could see some private one day going, oh, you know, would you get – he sees his mate, his buddy walking by with a machine gun, and he's got this old 3 boat action in Springfield. He goes, would you get that? And he goes, oh, there's a bunch of machine guns. Go grab one. So, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get me a machine gun. So they all had machine guns enough ammo. So when Vandergrift, the division commander, walked through there before this battle, he said, this is a machine gun. It's paradise. Even though they're limited – fields of fire and what the marines would do they would they would cut firing lanes 75 to 100 yards off diagonally and you know when you in place the machine guns you put them in infilade you know you don't put right. them straight in the infilade and they put these at an infilade knowing the japanese coming through a thick jungle and it's very thick jungle in there would hit those um least past resistance especially being because these guys had, had um did a, a march of about 15 to 16 miles through thick jungle it took them about three or four days so they're already right. spent. So they're going to hit that least pass resistance, you know, and you've got your machine gun there, you know, on a fixed, um, on a, on a fixed tripod with your T and E uh, traversing elevation locked in, they're going to go straight into them fields of fire and they're going to cut them up. And they did. And that's what uh, Barcelona and the rest of these guys did. But to get back to, there was 2,600 yards that 500 yeah. Marines of the first time seven, um, regiment initially they had the second battalion in the seventh marines under hh H. hannikin but what they did was there was the japanese had a good plan they had a great plan at the mouth at the mouth of matanical they want to do a holding action and mm -hmm. you know if you know anything about guadalcanal that's with a major tank assault you've seen these famous photos of the japanese tanks um, yeah. destroyed the mouth of matanical they want to assault there with that and a regiment of the fourth uh, infantry regiment and the marines at that stage had two battalions far deployed to hold the Jap they wanted to keep Japanese on the other side of Matanikau. But they had an exposed ridge where Page was. That was the um, Kola Ridge exposed. Right. And the Japanese, they were going to hold them there. They're going to send another regiment around and cut those two Marine battalions off. And at the same time, they got had they had the um, second division with the six or seven thousand guys coming up from the south that they didn't know about. They were going to hit that that line with puller anymore. Well what they did was the Marines you know, didn't see the Japanese coming from the south, so they pulled that battalion of Hanikins, the two seven off, and reinforced those two forward battalions in Matanikau, and they put them on that that left hand um, exposed flank to cover right. Kola Ridge, and that that's where you come to the Mitchell Page action, which was a night after Barcelon, and there was about five miles away. You know, I've heard some or heard and read some accounts that Mitchell Page was on Bloody Ridge, I and mean, he was five miles away from Bloody Ridge. He was nowhere near Barcelon, but he right. earned it. He earned his medal. And to me, I mean, both of them were, did outstanding work. And But Page um, has been overshadowed, I think, by Barcelona. But the more you read about Page's um, exports, what he did is simply, I mean, Barcelona did amazing things also. But with Page, you know, you read in his, it's like, wow. You know, Page actually did hold a ridge by himself. And Page actually yeah. put the machine gun up, the, the heavy machine gun, and fired it from the hill. Barcelona never fired a machine gun from the hill. Um, and Page actually led a counterattack charge down a hill, carrying wow. that machine. You know, and Charles Waterhouse, the famous Marine um, combat uh, artist, has a good photo of or um, a painting of, of Page leading it. So that's Casamento. That? That's Anthony oh. Casamento. That's another another Medal of Honor. Uh, that brings me to a point of all the enlisted Medal of Honors earned in Guadalcanal, all yeah. earned by machine gunners. All five enlisted Medal of Honors earned on the land on Guadalcanal was earned by machine gunners. 
So it's three Marine machine gunners and two U.S. Army machine gunners. So it shows you the defensive nature of the Guadalcanal campaign. That's amazing. So they, now we're, we're looking at Mitchell or Page and Barcelona here, right? And it's a good photo. This was at um, Count Balcom or Balcom Mobile in, in um, Melbourne, Australia. This is obviously after Guadalcanal when they went to Australia for rest and recreation. You know, it's famously depicted in the Pacific series. You know, they yeah. had a lot, a lot of, I don't know, much, too much rest. They called it a lot of recreation, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the official Medal of Honor ceremony. And there on the left-hand side, you get um, four Medal of Honor earners. You got uh, left-hand guys, the Vandergriff, uh, the Major General. So he earned a Medal of Honor. Then the next guy is Red Mike Edson, and the famous Raiders Edson. He earned his on Bloody Ridge. That's Edson there. The guy to his right is uh, Mitchell Page. And then you got John Bassalone to the, the far right. And you'll notice something about – can you pick anything about the uniforms? I know the, the listeners can't hear this, but can you pick anything about the uniforms by looking at that? Uh, let's see. It looks like Page has got a sidearm. He's got a forty-five. Um, now look at the uniforms. Don't look at the weapons. Look at the uniforms. Oh. So look at look at Vandergriff's uniform. Compare them to the other three. Well, they're wearing wearing alphas, and the other guys wearing. They're wearing all that. army tops. <laughs> oh, is that what they're wearing? I was okay. like, okay. Because when they came out of when they came out of Guadalcanal, a lot of their sea bags or duffel bags, as some people know it, were left on ship or left in New Zealand, and you know, or God. left to the rear echelon guys who probably got into it. But anyway, they, um, they arrived. They didn't have any dress uniforms. Obviously, the major general had his dress uniform, but right. the other, you know, the, the colonel and the the other guys didn't have there. So what they did was they went to an Australian um, army, an Australian military, and said, well, can we use some of your jackets? So they, they modified them. They known as the battle jackets. So they put their division patch on the left-hand side, and they became known as um, uh, some of these guys that know the uniforms out there know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, they're called battle jackets. Very, yeah. And they adopted them um, for later official use, and they, they modified them. And, they look very much like the Ike or Eisenhower jackets. Yeah. I mean, we've seen them in later. But, yeah, that was, yeah, you can see you can look like a – especially, you know, how, how neat and, you know, as we know, and even today, the, all the, the Marine uniforms are tailored. You can see the nice tailored uniform to the Vandegrift and the rest of them are yeah. like backs. And the thing about <laughs> – <laughs> Page, you notice Page is a lieutenant there. Well, Page was a platoon sergeant when he earned his, earned his medal, and then he got a battlefield commission. Why, okay, so that's why he's got the forty-five, and that's why you'll see it. He's on his um, his um, cap there. Yeah, yeah, he's got the bars. Almost called a piss cutter, but we can't call it piss cutter anymore, can we? Um, yeah, no, his, you like, gotta be. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have the PC police come get you. <laughs> hey, this is the kind of stuff you you find all out there. There's a um, U.S. hand grenade. Yeah, you don't want to find that. Uh, yeah, Japanese. Japanese. Hand grenade, and they're all from Bloody Ridge, just laying on the ground, just laying around, isn't it? Yeah. Every time we find an explosion, or some, um, you know, I work with the police over there. They have a great EOD team. The local guys. I mean, they've they've been trained by the Americans and the Australians, so they're very good at what they do. And um, we go mark them and and we we get rid of them. What the only thing, the only thing that what I don't like about. I know, I, you know, I love relics too. You know, I'm, I'm, I collect my relics, and I understand why when tourists go over there, a lot to have a relics, even though it's against the War Relic Act in in Solomon Islands, unless you have a permit from the National Museum. But what it does do, you get the locals, especially you know the third world uh, locals and the kids, they go dig up these relics to sell to the the tourist. And I've had a number of them. I can't. I've lost count. Adults too walk up to me with a grenade. Oh, I found this. You want to, how much you want to buy this for? He's like, yeah, I don't, hold on. we don't. We don't want to buy this. We want to like put this on the ground, you know. And, and the Japanese knee mortars are the, probably the most dangerous. They yeah. look like little cans. And um, I've had them walk up to me and, and try to give me a live hand grenade, live knee mortar, things like that. So they they digging around to try to get money to sell to the tourists to get yeah. those relics to to sell to the the guys that came come there so i mean i understand both sides of the coin but i try to persuade them from doing that because you know i don't want them little, little kids get their hand blew off or die right well it was kind of like okinawa um 
there was well the stuff in okinawa the humidity the water um anything metal really rusted out and i noticed one of your videos that you have on the site and once again i'll show this walking the battlefield on youtube uh you go through all the relics that have been discovered and they're laid out on tables and you have mess kits and various conditions of wow i mean they found something in a cave it looked brand new to pretty worn out um magazines shells clips uh, from the uh, m1 grands mortars hand grenades i mean Boy, you've got airplanes. You've got all sorts of uh, stuff. Are there still a lot of like tanks just sitting out in the jungle that people don't know about? Not so much tanks. I mean, there were one, one I think it was found 2009 in great condition. It was one of the tanks that was taken out uh, in September, one of the Marine tanks taken out by Japanese uh, anti tank fire. Mm. It's got the, the machine guns on it and the holes in the tanks and everything else. And it was, it, it's still on the island. Someone's refurbishing it. But, um, there's still planes found to this day, not so much around Henderson anymore. They're mainly in the, through the thick jungle because you know, Guadalcanal is 90 miles long. There's another yeah. area where there you're showing a photo. That was just a, a local museum uh, at a school called Beta Karma School. And, and <clears throat> they have different bits and pieces there. Just like I said earlier, to the very beginning of the um, the show, Guadalcanal was a major um, log logistical and training base. So there's still stuff left from all that too. Yeah. I read once um, somewhere with over a million Americans passed through Guadalcanal in World War II because you had major hospitals there. It was a rear area base, you know, it was a staging base and training base. Right. In the poor first Marine division after, after they, they went to Cap, Cape Gloucester after, and then they came back to thought after Cape Gloucester, they were going to come back to um, Australia, but they got to send them to Pavuvu, which is in Russell Island. Never gotten a chance to go to Pavuvu, but yeah. Well, you know, somebody told me once a long time ago that the Japanese soldiers were allowed for a period of time to grow the fingernails, fingernails and their hair out, facial, whatever, and then shave it, send it all back to their parents so that mm -hmm. when they were missing, their parents had something of them to bury, which to me, it, it, it's not the whole body, but it, I can, I, I get the idea of taking this to be able to, uh, to bury something of your son. Do the Japanese make an effort to go back to um, repatriate the bodies like we do, or are they all still just buried out there somewhere? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I think 20, 30 years ago when you had uh, some of the veterans going back, and they'd go back and there were bones, bones found there all the time. Uh, you know, it's no accurate estimate, on, but there's been some great um, – Estimates of how many actually perished on Guadalcanal Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, in between twenty to twenty-five thousand, up to thirty thousand. So I, I hit in the middle. I say around twenty-five thousand and died on uh, Guadalcanal, and they call it Starvation Island. So a lot of yeah. them died in the jungle, especially in these these marches and things. So the, the bones are everywhere. So sometimes in these thick jungles, the bones just land on top of the ground. But Honey R was built on top of the battlefield right after the war. Or sorry, right after the the fighting in in February forty-three the U S turned into a major base. So they just bulldozed and concreted everything. So we're the major majority of the fighting in Guadalcanal happened around the Tanacal Point Cruz area, which is now downtown Haniara. So Americans built a medium sized city. And then when the end of the war, when the, the British came back in, instead of going to Tulagi, they had a, a purpose made a city built for them. So they moved into Haniara. So a lot of these uh, remains are still under the concrete. Now, to answer your question, when these bones are found, and I've seen in 2009, I was there. I seen a big um, religious, I think they call it Shinto. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, I've got that right. Shinto ceremony. So what they do is they take the bones, and they have a cremation ceremony on site, and then uh -huh. they take the ashes back. And there's a big shrine. Is it called the Star Little Y? You probably know about it. in Tokyo. Yo, um, anyway it's a big big shrine to the war dead in, in tokyo then they, they're supposed to take the, the ashes back there oh. but they don't have uh, repatriation um or they don't come look for their their bodies like we do in the dpa dp double guys you know when i was there three times and the dpa double a's been on there and hopefully they'll come back to guadalcanal now that the 
once the COVID restrictions are lifted. So they do some great work there and recovering the, the U.S. missing, which is uh, quite a number of U.S. missing. Yeah. In fact, the area I worked, uh, the missing from from the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines on the, the little Dunkirk action, they call it, um, are still there. And my office was right, right on top of them. I used to think about them every day. Do you, uh, that was kind of weird thought, but did you ever experience any spirits or any, you know, any, I say ghosts, but uh, any, any things that you just got the presence, the feelings of good, bad, or um, panic feeling or anything weird like that? Because, I mean, that's, I, I lived on a Civil War battle line. So this I is, ghosts, a I had ghosts in my house um, oh. in New Bern, North Carolina where the yeah. confederates um i'll use my australian sense of humor now and say yeah, yeah especially after uh, a pint of jack daniels i'll say all kind of ghosts and spirits but but <laughs> <laughs> to be serious now um no there was there was only one place on guadalcanal i mean bloody ridge i'd go up there all the time i've, I've probably been to bloody ridge over 300 times i, I calculated and i'd go up there it's a very peaceful area and i'd go up there to read books and just sit and stuff and it was a very peaceful area only one part of Guadalcanal ever got kind of the heebie-jeebies you call it or the hair stands up on the back of your neck because I you know I went to all these areas by myself roughly in the thick jungle it was at Coffin Corner and that was the area I was discussing earlier where you know you had thousands of Japanese that died and they were buried in these mass pits and in my video I've got some of the uh, I'll show you where the, the pits are then I got a Facebook site too called Guadalcanal Walking the Battlefield too and I oh I update every every one to two days and I, I, I try to put um material there it's never been seen before and then and now so. but the burial pits are still there in the 1980s the the bones were, were taken out and, and, and cremated but in that area alone and i'm standing in the area at, at coffin corner the, the apex of the jeep trail which is the main assault the japanese were you know hundreds of them were pounding in this trying to go for this one trail you know and it was both sides of the trail was covered 37 millimeter any tank guns you know i've got the maps it shows every gun on there. You know, you got a small area, you know, 70, 80 yards long. Right. Two 37 millimeters, like a couple of 50 cows, a number of 30 cows, and then rifles all concentrate. And then you got artillery all concentrating in one area. And that was the area where they actually did stack them up. And, um, yeah, I, I've got a bit of uh, weird feeling in that area, but I didn't see any, any ghosts and any uh, bonsai charging Japanese. Now, what, something I'm thinking about there. I mentioned to you before, I spoke to a 97 year old veteran the other day who's still alive called George Mason. Mm -hmm. He was one of the gunners of a 37 at that area, 37 millimeter anti tank gun. George Mason. Wait a minute. George Mason. Why do I know that name? He lives oh. in Florida. And he's actually on the map. I, I did all research on it. He's actually on the mud map drawn at the time or drawn later of one of gun crew members. And he. Yeah was actually at that area manning that 37 millimeter gun and the yeah. stories he was telling his his recollection is just like it was yesterday and he's very switched on it was such an amazing opportunity to speak to him i only spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and i have a friend who's who's actually um, arranged for him to to fire a lot of a real 37 millimeter here next month no way Wait, yeah, all right. he'll, he'll he'll oh he's gonna love it he's gonna oh, love dude. it you got to get me, got, please get me hooked up with point of contact. I, I would love to interview that guy before he yeah. closes his eyes and uh, and doesn't wake up. Oh, but his, his, oh, his recollection is, I mean, he was telling me the nomenclature with 37 and he knows all the, oh, just the detailed parts, all the guys. I've, in got, the, a, I've uh, got a 37 millimeter shell right up there by the uh, Medal of Honor. Deal. My grandfather, it's a uh, trench art from World War One. Wow. Well, so it's got the it's got the badge on it, the tank badge, and they had made trench art out of it, and you pull it apart, and they they took they took all the the powder out. I mean, but the primer and everything's still in the head. Wow. Anyway, it's cool. Great relic. Yeah, it really is. Well, when they open it up and you do go back, is there is it easy to go back and visit as a as a tourist? I'm I'm a marine. I want to go back with you. you know, while you're there, is it accessible how hard is it to get there it's actually fairly easy i mean um, this is before covid um if they 
I guess Let's say they lift the restrictions. Do you fly into Sydney and then over, or where, where do you go? Yeah, they reinstate the, the same flights I had before. No, um, you can leave directly from the West Coast of the United States if you're coming from, obviously, from the U.S. And they flew to Nandi in Fiji. Uh-huh. And I think maybe stopped overnight in Nandi. Or, and then they flew straight to Honiara. And Honiara is International Airport, which is old Henderson Field. Um, they get picked up. I mean, they got Western-style hotels uh, in Guadalcanal, and it's, it's, it's fairly straight shot. You know, my friend, my best friend, I knew him since first grade, couldn't visit me when I was over there. He lives in Texas, but he took him 44 hours. But, you know, <laughs> he, got, <laughs> he, got, he got delayed a, a few times. But it's just, it's fairly straight shot. I mean, some of the, the um, military tour groups from the States, they they fly out to, I know, Fiji, then, you know, they got a Air Fiji, I think. They call yeah. it. It lands in yeah. – and go out of I have to look at look at doing that because that, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Wake Wake Island. Uh, Iwo Jima was there for the fiftieth. That was really cool, and went back a couple times taking squadron tours. I was the <laughs> unit historian, so I was the guy walking the battlefield and giving, you know, here we are and blah 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 and Admiral, you know, I miss that. I really do that. Yeah, that Great. military history to me just appeals, and it's. So far gone now, 80 years, most people don't even know the names of these little islands, you know, and the campaigns. And we definitely have to keep that history alive for sure. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, for my uh, YouTube site and my Facebook site, especially my Facebook. I mean, I keep it, um, that was to keep people, uh, I guess, remembering what these guys did. And I wanted to share their experiences uh, with them. Especially Guadalcanal. I mean, in, yeah, Guadalcanal was such a long campaign, and in the jungle alone, even if no one was shooting at them, the jungle alone basically destroyed. I mean, it took a whole year for these guys to get uh, basically fit again so they could fight. On on Facebook, it's the site salt. It's still walking a battlefield. Yeah, it's Guadalcanal walking a battlefield with Facebook. Not updated every every day sometimes, but and also got us a. a, a point there where i've got a lot of uh, veteran relatives contact me right and i share their veteran story on there I, you know their veterans photos and talk about what they did and i help a lot of um relatives too because um i have access to some information especially muster roles and things like that their name a, a marine or it's easier to find a marine than a soldier due to you know obviously all the records were burned but you can work out what unit they were and once they i know what unit they were in i could basically walk them through you know, send them pictures, especially then and now, of what to air with their ancestors fault. And so, well, well, I can't, I can't leave on without asking you a question. You have got what the viewers can't see behind you is you have at least six rows of bookshelves, and that bookshelf, uh, folks, goes about twenty feet along that wall. I swear, it's about twenty feet. <laughs> Out of all those books, give me your. Number oh. one book, like if you were to walk in and and I said, "Hey, give me a book you recommend." What book are you going to pull out for me to read? Oh, that, that's a hard one. It's a very. I know hard it's hard. One. Give me or give me your top three. You can you can give me your top you three like books. And you can. It's all military history, so yeah. I don't know what era of military history. You know. World War Two. It doesn't matter, but give me your top three books that you would recommend. Hey, this is a really good read that a lot of people don't know about. What is your favorite? I always ask that um, because people have some really cool stuff that I've never had, and I end up going buying the book. I right, put me on the spot here. No, yeah, I know it's it's a tough question. To Let me have a look. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Well, we're talking about Guadalcanal. Um, Richard Frank's uh, Guadalcanal book is probably the best, most accurate. I mean, there's so many Guadalcanal books out there. Um, you know, I don't have that. So it breaks right now. Now, but Richard Frank's Guad- if you want to know about Guadalcanal and get a very accurate depiction of Guadalcanal, I'd read Richard Frank's Guadalcanal. Um, okay. I've got, I've got a couple of working copies, but you know, if there's one. Oops, oh, cool. I'll look, Guadalc- yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't know. I like a lot of the personal memoirs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of, of World War II, the personal memories. How much for my how much for my pillow? Helmet for my pillow is good with the old braid with sledge is good for for memoir memoirs. Yeah. Um, I like John Hoffman's work because I'm I'm a big 
I'm big on historical accuracy. Mm-hmm. Now that I put a lot of research and you know do a lot of investigation because you know, I'm an investigator by <clears throat> by my job. So yeah, you know, I like to do you- make sure everything's factual and factual based. So John Hoffman's a, a I don't know if you, I don't know if you ever met John. Did you no. meet John? Mm-hmm. So his his book on Chesty Puller and Red Mark Edson is it, is it, real good. Not okay. Like Would you ever consider writing a book yourself? Yeah, I've got I've got one in in the working process progress. It's about my Guadalcanal um, adventure, so to speak. Yeah. Um, about my actually walking the battlefield, what I seen, what my observations were, how it, uh, it was then, now compared to now. Yeah. And. Yeah, just just you know, sharing maybe kind of like a transition between then and now. Yeah, I mean, just telling a story and breaking up the chapters like that, like a chapter on Barcelona and Page and Davis and and the different. So areas. it would be an all encompassing deal, but it would be more personal down to where they were. Where somebody who writes a book on that guy or biography is not going to have that that experience. Yeah. Yeah, just stay and get a little bit of a, I guess, a bio on them, a little information about why yeah. they're famous and why I'm looking for them, so to speak, and, and verifying uh, what I've read and the things I've come across and what I've seen. You know, when I get there, what I'm feeling and, you know, what my observations were and, and just sharing it to the readers. So, Well, let me that. know. I'd like to be a proofreader. I'll volunteer for that. I do that all the time. I will, yeah. I will volunteer, send me a PDF. I will read it and then I'll go through and catch any things, typos or stuff that I catch. But no, hey, listen, it. I yeah, sign me up, brother. Uh, I can't <laughs> thank you enough um, for coming on, spending. This is Anzac Day, right? So, yeah, in Australia, it's um, at the, the um, early morning um, celebration, I wouldn't say celebrations, but memorial services, which yeah. is a great. Tradition to having, I notice it's 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 different than the U.S. I mean, it's not um I won't say U.S. Is, they they say here that U.S. is over the top, but it's a different style of um, memorials. I mean, there's no fireworks or anything like that. They do have a parade. What they do, they have a early morning dawn service because an Anzac Day uh, commemorates anyone that served in the um, armed forces of Australia and New Zealand, uh, like a Memorial Day, but um. Basically, it, it commemorates the 25th of, of April 1915 with the um, Anzacs, Australians, New Zealand landed at Gallipoli and they landed at pre dawn. And here, almost in every little town in Australia, they have a dawn ceremony. That's cool. So what the, everyone comes out at dawn at 4 30, it starts and you're out there. Then, you know, there's certain things they do, you know, they, they reading, read certain things and they, they announce and they had the play of the, um, uh, it's kind of like taps, but it's a different style of taps in Australia. Yeah. And then later in the um, day, about 10 o'clock, they kick off a parade and they yeah. march. And at 11, 11 o'clock, the whole nation stops for a moment of silence. The whole nation does. Yeah. But the thing about the the parade, I mean, it's a bit controversial, but in, <clears throat> in the old days, obviously, the parade was, it was only for the veterans who would march. But obviously, since it's been in the Great War, there's no – or War One, there's no vets left. But what, what they started doing traditionally – uh, if you had an ancestor that was in the Anzacs, right, you could march with them. And then now that they're no longer there, you can march in it. Say, for example, a son or daughter yeah. or grandson or granddaughter. And you get to wear their medals. But you wear their medals and the, <clears throat> all the national medals in Australia, just like in the U.S., uh, the national or the not in the U.S., but, you know, uh, you wear your medals on the left hand side when you wear medals. Right. In Australia, um, you can wear their medals. On the right hand side, you see some guys. In Australia, you'll see them wearing on the left hand side. That's their own medals they earn. But if they see them wearing the medals on the right hand side, that's a relative state medal. If it's a national medal, then it's you go. Hey, this you know this guy's thirty years old. He's got World War One medals. What's going on there? But he's, yeah. he's wearing his ancestors, his grandfathers, great grandfathers. What a tribute! That's cool. You know, and to me, I, I support that because it, it it the tradition carries on because the right. vet's not going to be here forever. Right, and then if they all die out, then no one marches at all. Then people forget, but then right. they carry on their tradition. So I think it's a great tradition here. It's kind of like just up in Gainesville, Texas. We had the Medal of Honor uh, weekend, and I mean they've had they've had uh, from the start. You know, Doc Ballard, one Medal of Honor recipient, 
to like 25 Medal of Honor recipients. And they have a big parade. All the people that have armor, vehicles, we all come out there. I mean, there were half tracks. There were Jeeps galore. Uh, <laughs> I brought my mutt out because my ferret, my little armored scout car was uh, uh, getting a um, new manifold gasket put in. But uh, what what was really awesome about this parade was they brought the widows of past recipients who have spent many years going to this thing. They flew them in as well. And I had uh, Patricia Pittman, Patty Pittman, uh, mm -hmm. in my Jeep and her husband, Rick, a Marine Vietnam Medal of Honor recipient, in his dress blues that she donated to the uh, to Gainesville and they're building a museum. I just think it's neat that they honor them. So we're going down the street and they see Patricia Pittman on the uh, car and, and they're just going crazy. And it, it really was a neat honor. I'm glad that they did that. And you're absolutely right. If you don't do something, then there's nobody in the parade. Well, who, what are you clapping for? You know, no one's going to march at all. Yeah. Keep the memories alive. I do like that, man. What a great deal. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, Dave, do me a favor. You hang on for a second. Um, I'll sign off to the folks and then uh, I'll catch up with you in just one second. All right. All right. Well, thanks again for, for having me on. It's been a Are pleasure. You getting, is there anything that you want to promote? Is there, oh, uh, no. just the Facebook, we got the Facebook and YouTube, which people I'll, I'll make sure that it goes into the comments as well. Highly recommend go subscribe. If you're into history, it's a point of view living history as you walk the battlefield, which is and a so lot of us not able to. Yeah, and if someone wants any Guadalcanal information, especially looking up any relatives or things, just especially go through my Facebook and send me a, a PM through my Facebook. Can you can you get me some sand? <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure that I get you some sand. I remember I took some Marines one time. They were, they come to visit. I used to take all. Of, well, I took all of. I did all the battlefield tours and stuff over there in battlefield study groups. And there was some Marines that came there one time, and they were at Alligator Creek and. You know, real, very quick story there, Alligator Creek, and they go, oh, and they pulled out the little vials, and they fill them full of sand, and, and I seen one group, and I, I was speaking to the sergeant major, I said, uh, sergeant major, he goes, yeah, I said, you might not want to tell that group over there to take their sand from over there, he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, that was, that's the local uh, toilet. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, they moved them away from that area, because, you know, that was where they were squatting in the um, ocean, and that was where the, the public toilet was, and they were digging all the sand up from that. Uh, yeah, it's hard to measure like hey, hey, hey. I'll say I'll make sure that you don't get any um well I can if you want, but no, no, no. I I I prefer the non poopy sand. <laughs> now hey, how long did you spend in the Marines in the US Marines? Uh, eight years. Eight years, what'd you do? Uh, I went from from eighty five to ninety three. So it was a my MOS was a 0331 initially, and which machine gunner. Then I went to um, barracks duty. Then I became a, a 8541, which is a scout sniper. And I did that for a number of years until I became MSG. Wow. That's cool, <laughs> man. What a career, dude. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I don't have an MSG coin. Where, where are you in Australia? How far are you from uh, MC in Sydney? Oh, the MC is in Canberra, which is the capital city. Oh, how far are you from there? Well, I live in Canberra. <laughs> oh. Well, you know what? How about I'll send you the money. Hook me up with a uh, MSG coin from from Canberra. I, I don't have one from Australia. Yeah. I'll try yeah. to get All the t-shirt. Every time I ask for a t-shirt, they're, oh, we don't sell them right now, sir. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, all those bastards. You know what? I was in China. I'm in Beijing. and And I drive all the way over to the embassy, and they're like, sorry, sir, we don't have any more coins. Like what? You're in China, man. They make them in China. Make some damn coins. All right, I'm coming back next month. You better have coins, Marine. And they're like, oh yes, sir. And uh, Argentina. I was in uh, Buenos Aires, and it was my exercise, and it was three and a half miles to the embassy. Like I got it all mapped out and got my city maps to go, so I can use it offline. I walked to the embassy. They turned me away twice. So that was. Uh, uh, three and a half, six, or maybe it was the six miles. And I took a taxi back. I can't remember one of the places very long, but that was my exercise for layovers. <laughs> and I got all the coins. I'll have to take a picture of the embassy coins. Well, mm -hmm. listen, uh, 
Great talking to you, Dave. I'm going to pull you off and I'll say goodbye and I'll be with you in one second. Thanks again, Taco. Hey, cheers. Folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is pre recorded. Um, Dave is uh, available today, which is Anzac Day, which is their holiday. So I was so blessed to be able to speak to him. And then I'll bring it to you on a future show. So if you wonder why um, your comments uh, probably aren't getting replied to by, by Dave or we're able to incorporate the questions, pre-recorded. But once again, I can't thank you for joining us. Hit like, subscribe, share, join the group, go to his page and, and sign up, please. Yeah, telling you, we can't go, especially if uh, air travel is too far for a 44-hour trip. But feel free to uh, look at his videos and it will give you a great personal view of walking the spaces. Until next Tuesday, you guys have a great night. Adios, hasta luego, a vidas en chus, she she ni, au revoir, domo regato gozaimas, tano shindi, a kudasai chao, rivadici, and asvidanya, nastrovia. I'll talk to you later.